Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a, an analytical hypnotherapist as well as a psychological astrologer. And I'm very excited because today I have Sherry Mandel with me, who is the author of this intriguing book, The Kabbalah of Writing. I, I think just the, the idea of the two together was intriguing for me, but I think it would be very good, Sherry, if you could begin by telling us what the Kabbalah is. Oh, okay, that's tough. But <laughs> Kabbalah is the, Jew, the, the Jewish mystical tradition. And some people say it dates from the Garden of Eden. Some, some say it dates from Avraham. Some say it dates from uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And then there are others that say it's like started in the 1200s, I think. But it's the mystical tradition that accompanies the Bible, basically. But that was passed down orally. And the word Kabbalah, le kabel in Hebrew means to receive. So it was a tradition that was received. And it's a lot of it is very esoteric. And I am not, a, you know, a master of Kabbalah by any means. I, I take the structure of the spirit, which is a, a small part of the Kabbalah. And I use it to explore writing. I thought that the, the way that you blended these 10 spheres um, of, of elemental spiritual structure, as you, as you described them, um, with writing was absolutely intriguing. So can you perhaps tell us what those um, 10 spheres are and, and how they relate to writing? Okay. Well, first of all, the spherot, I, I call them the spiritual architecture of the world. So they're the way that God sends his energy to us. But it's also, I mean, God has a part of, of himself that he doesn't transmit, that we don't receive. But those channels come down to us. And we're also a mixture of those channels. So it starts from the highest place, which is Keter, which is crown, which is very hard to speak about. And then basically the spirot or the channels, they move between a kind of limit, uh, this, the forces of limitation and the forces of generosity. And then there's a place in the middle where they meet. So, for example, there's the force of Gvura, which is limitation. Um, and there's the force of Chesed, which is kindness, which is generosity or abundance. And they meet in Tiferet, which is beauty or harmony. But each sphera contains all of the sphera. So it's, it's not the way I did it. I separated them. But actually in our everyday lives, we, it's very rare for us to operate only from kindness because there's, there are all, always other forces at work. And in fact, kindness, for example, if you are always generous and kind to a child and you never limit that child, then the child will not grow up to, um, to be well, really, because there's limitation in the universe and there's limitation in our lives. So the spherot are always working between those two forces to, to find like temporary harmony. Even Tiferet, which is harmony or beauty, there's something really nice about it because part of it is seeing beauty even in the ordinary. It doesn't have to be something glorious. And I think that Writing also gives us that opportunity to take something small or mundane. And when you look at it closely, you can see that there's something glorious about it or even holy. And a lot of time, times I think writers are working to kind of find the gilui, that's like the 
the discovery, the revelation, because that's really what writing is about. It's, it's like if you're writing only like a diary, you, let's say you're just writing what you did, well, you're not really discovering something new. But when you write and you put different imagery together and different thoughts and different like things you've learned, then there's the possibility of synergy and something new to you can be revealed. I like the way that you you describe this process in a sense that you're writing in a sense what you already know, but by writing what you know, you're discovering something new. I think that that's, that's so true. And very often working with clients, I will suggest that they start keeping a journal. And I mean, I did that at the weekend. I had a, a, a newish client who has difficulty in, in connecting with her feelings. And I asked her to start keeping a journal just so that she could start noticing her feelings. And, and I think what I'm hoping is that in the process of, of doing that, that she'll be opening up to understanding more about herself. Right, yeah. But it's also maybe asking her, to write about what she sees or perceives, but to do it in a way that she's writing about the object and not only about herself, and then giving her the ability to bounce off of imagery. Because a lot of times imagery can help us figure out a way of renewing ourselves or a way of discovering something that we didn't understand. Absolutely. And that imagery is at the core of my work as a, as a hypnotherapist. So it's also at the core of my work as a, psycho uh, as a psychological astrologer because it's rooted in the imagery of mythology to help us to get the insights that we need. And so it's imagery is, is everything because I think to a great extent, we also think in metaphor and so when we're when you're we're writing and we're having to describe something we are having to use language that's imagery language to describe how we're feeling what we're doing mm -hmm. yeah well i can give you an example of that because um my son was murdered 22 years ago by terrorists kobe mandel and um I wrote a book called The Blessing of a Broken Heart here after he was killed. And he was 13, he was my oldest son. I have three other kids. Now, thank God I have grandchildren too. And after he was killed, a lot of birds came into my life. Like birds would, they would knock into my head. They would fall down in front of me dead. One attached itself to the, um, to, to the headlight of my car. It was like everywhere I went, there were birds. And so in the book, I wrote a lot about birds and birds' nests. But Kobe was killed in a cave with his friend, Yosef Ishran. So when I was writing the book, in the beginning, it was a lot about the cave and darkness and all the pain of grief and the pain of murder and the pain of my family to live without Kobe. And then I had the parts about um, the birds and birds nests. And I didn't know how I was gonna put the book together. And um, eventually I realized that the two parts of the book were the cave and the birds nest. And that the cave is a very closed place. And where we live, that's um, Kobe, he was killed in a cave, but he was on his way to the biggest cave in the Middle East, only like a quarter of a mile from, a, like a quarter kilometer from our house. And that cave, that cave, you can't get out of it if you don't have somebody to help because it's so dark or if you don't have a light. But um, the bird's nest is the opposite image because the bird's nest is open 
and there's light and it's also a place of birth. So once I discovered that as the arrangement of the book, and also the bird's nest is also related to um, Jewish tradition, because actually in the Kabbalah, it says that there's a, it's called a supernal bird's nest. And that's where the Messiah waits to redeem the world. So once I learned that and had the arrangement of the book, I mean, it's not like I was better or healed, but there was something inside of me that like gave birth. You know, there was, there was an opening. So I think that whenever you can you use an image and sort of reverse it or find an other meaning your it's it's a means of renewal for for you as a person and also for your work as an as an artist or as a healer indeed it's 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 such a vital way of expressing communicating processing and gaining insight it's it's a it's a beautiful thing the way that we use imagery I was also just thinking about what you had said um, about it being between limit and abundance or generosity and how it comes into the middle and what you've got is beauty. I think that's absolutely gorgeous, um, the way of, of framing that. But it also made me think about how limitation often forces us to be creative um so often with clients they they feel very restricted they're very very limited and i say to them right so what can you do and that then sparks off a very creative process in whether it's solve problem solving or whether it's an actually creating something um, and it put me in mind of, oh, some years ago, some, uh, there was a cookery program. Was it Ready, Steady, Cook or something like that? Where they only, they gave you a very limited number of ingredients. And you had no idea what those ingredients were going to be, or the, the participants didn't. And then they were expected to create something amazing with that limited number of ingredients so there is something there about a restricted palette with which to work forcing us mm -hmm. to really think and generate something yeah the the limits really engender creativity and people often think that freedom is having no limits and often that's not freedom because Lots of people, when they don't have limits, they really don't know what to do. And really often it's structure and discipline creates the freedom. But when you think about it, also the creation of the world, that God had to limit himself with the world because otherwise there would be no space for creation. So, and also we're limited. I mean, everybody dies and we're all limited in terms of who we are, right? We can't be everything at once so we're born into a world of limitation and there's a beauty to that really because we we couldn't do anything if we were infinite like there would be no room for relationship like we're always in relationship i think because we're we're missing something i like what you said there about um we're limited you know, our lifespan is limited. But, you know, it made me think about, well, what would it be like to not have that limit? Yeah. Because one of the things that we are as a, as a species is we're very ingenious and very motivated to do things. Would that right. still be there if there was no essence of time passing? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I, I think that there wouldn't be because everything could be put off. And also, I mean, I think that in essence, also like now, 
there's a big movement to sort of combat death and have artificial intelligence and live forever. But that's what people are working toward. And if there was eternity or infinity, then there'd be nothing to work toward. People would probably work toward trying to kill themselves. <laughs> well, I would argue that that's, uh, we're heading in that direction. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> not to. I, I hope that some sense will prevail. Um, where does wisdom come into this process? Oh, wisdom. Well, um, first of all, there's chokhmah, which I I translate as inspiration, but but that means wisdom. And then dina is the the next era. That means comprehension. And um, I, I like something in the book that's about um, how to develop an essay. Also about how to think about anything. And it's based on something called Cordes, which is Jewish mysticism. It's about four rabbis, they entered the, this orchard, but the orchard is, is like a mystical and one died, one, um, I think, killed him. One got sick and only one, Rabbi Akiva, was able to withstand the um, intensity of, of this mystical place. But Pardes, it also um, stands for four different ways of understanding the world. And Pardes, it's the pay in Hebrew, it's shot, which means the simple meaning. And it, those are people who like, they know the facts, they can tell you, <laughs> you know, history, they know science, like things that are concrete, like what, when, where, not so much the what. And then remez is the next um, word in, in this hermeneutics. And remez means hint. But it also means like, what does this suggest to you? What does this open up for you? What does it remind you of? Have you experienced this before? Have you read about it? So, and that also requires reflection. And then the next level is drash, which means meaning. So it's, what is the meaning of this? And what's the meaning for you in your world? And What's the meaning for other people as well? Because the more you can think of your audience and other people who are listening, the more you'll include them in your work. And it becomes a bigger story. We always want to try to think of making our personal story a bigger story that resonates for more people. But the final level is sowed. Um, and sowed means secret. And sowed is... What can you say about this that is yours right now that hasn't been said before? You haven't even realized before. And when you get to that, and it takes a long time sometimes. Like I've worked on books and it took me like a year to figure out what's the so, what's the secret? What's the, it's really what's the treasure waiting here? And most people, they operate on different levels. And so it's interesting to think of personalities like that as well. But in writing, I think if you use all those levels, the simple meaning, what it reminds you of, what is the meaning for you and other people, and then what's special, what's, you know, they talk about like, what's the unique selling point, but what is unique? What What's unique about your vision? Because everybody has a different experience in this world. And when you really, connect to your deepest self, then I think you also have the ability to, co to connect to that level of sowed, of secret, but secret, not just in terms of privacy, but secret in terms of like, what's the treasure in your life? Yes. Made me think about how important it is to temper everything with wisdom, because otherwise, what we cre what we create without limit and without wisdom, we create monstrosities, which yeah. is 
you know, where you were talking about AI and I said, well, yeah, this could be the route to self-destruction. Absolutely. Unless we understand fully the implications of what we are creating and, or at least have an inkling of the implications of what we are creating, which means it has to be infused with some wisdom. Then we could be creating something that has unintended consequences. Oh yeah, for sure it's gonna have unintended consequences. I mean, I think it already is. My I already see I have a child who um well, he's an adult. But, and he's already looking on AI for you know to help him write his papers. And so what do you do as a teacher or a professor? Like it's it's not it's not just plagiarism because it's a whole world of information that's available. And also of thought. I mean, I don't understand it at all. But yeah, somebody, I hope somebody's figuring out how to limit it, but I doubt they are. Uh, well, we hope somebody um, is imbued with some wisdom soon. <laughs> no, that's the problem because it's it's intelligent. But intelligence doesn't mean wisdom. And there's a big gap between that. Exactly, exactly. So... The, the other thing that I, I really like about your book is, is well, actually there's a couple of things, but one of them is that what it's doing in a sense is it's bringing a practice of mindfulness of sorts to writing. Did you feel that when you were, when you were writing your book? Um, you know, I didn't think of it in terms of mindfulness, but I think that writing as a practice allows a person to pay attention because like I know I also I write children's books as well so I'm always paying attention because I'm always looking for a story and I'm always I'm not always but I'm often curious and I think that curiosity about life and also like after, for example, this is something different, but after Kobe was killed, also always looking for an answer. I was always looking for somebody to tell me what 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 this all meant and what I could do and how how I could heal. But um, you know, I, I worked in a hospital. I, I trained to be a pastoral counselor. So I worked in a hospital and I can't say that one person gave me the secret, but I also wrote a book about reaching for comfort. And it was it was really like I found that the love of the families where they the way they took care of their family members, that that for me became the secret. But I think whenever you have a question and also often writing is a question. So whenever you have a real question then you walk around looking for answers. And that kind of makes you more alive because you're more alert and you're more interested in even the, the little things, like even waiting online, you might encounter something. You're always searching for encounters. Actually, what that is, is being open to inspiration. Mm -hmm. and whether you are a writer or you are simply living your, your life or wanting to live your life in a magical way, you need to have that curiosity and that desire to find something because that's the point at which you start looking. And when you start looking, you are going to find something. The inspiration will come you will see the signs, the omens, whatever it is that you want to call it, the synchronicities um, that come in and suddenly you are properly engaged or you, are in, you feel like you are truly engaged in the process of life. Right. You're in, re you're in relationship to the world. And also like inspiration in Hebrew, the word for soul is neshama which is from to breathe. So it's like inspiration comes just from being born. It's part of our 
our like DNA to to need that inspiration and to to feel it, you know, and also even to feel inspired to be to be alive. Because when you think about it, it's such a miracle just to be alive that there's that there are human beings and that we're you know, everything we do is really a miracle. Yes, it is. So that brings me to the other thing I really like about your book is you you have writing exercises. So tell us about the writing exercises. Oh, well, well, there are a lot of them. I, I think I think the first one I give is to write a prayer or a wish for yourself in terms of what you want from this writing practice. And then I, I think the next one is about your name, to write about your name, because writing about your name unlocks a lot about yourself. Um, oh yeah, like my name here is Sheer. I changed my name recently to Sheer, Terry, because uh, Sheer in Hebrew means song. And in, in Hebrew, cherry, it gets confused with cherry, which is like cherry tomato in Hebrew. So I decided to be a song instead of a cherry tomato. But um, I just gave my students a writing exercise that some of them did, and some of them couldn't even do it. They, they, they refused to do it. It's a very powerful exercise. Write a, something about your mother's body. So that was um, that was very interesting, and I don't know. In the book, there's like a hundred exercises. I had to write them down because I don't remember them. <laughs> Look them up. But it's what I like about them is that they are they are invitations to go under the surface. You know, if you if you were saying to me. The first thing you know, I thought about as regards my name, it's it's short, it's it's easy, it's written in, it's it's written in the Portuguese form, um, which you only find in the Iberian Peninsula. In, 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 so it's part of my heritage. It's and then of course it's the the, the mother of Mary was Anna. Um, and I know that there are meanings around that as well. So the minute you you start looking at these exercises, all these little connections start to emerge, which is the the very process that gets you into writing and um, you know writing about you know write about my mother's body again. That's such a rich um, <laughs> do because that's where we come from. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite exercises is actually um, to write about the kitchen, your your mother or father's kitchen, to describe it. Because we all spend a lot of, I mean, most of us, a lot of time, time in those kitchens. And just doing the shot, doing the um, simple meaning often will lead to something more explosive or interesting. And so, Which is, I think, one of the reasons why doing the exercises could actually be very therapeutic. So you might be thinking you're, you're going into this because you want to improve your writing, but actually I feel very much that this is a book that I could recommend to many of my, my clients as a means of opening up and, and allowing that stream of consciousness to come through which is the basis for the healing work that we do together. So thank you very much for your yeah. wonderful book. <laughs> yeah, it's my pleasure. No, I think of it as writing. Of, I think of it as a healing book. Because also writing, you have the possibility of using imagination. So even if something terrible has happened, and something terrible has happened to everybody in this world eventually, you have the possibility of going back and saying, like, I wish, or I imagine that, or could have been that, or having a conversation with somebody who's no longer around. Like, it gives you possibilities that 
are like sort of not realistic, but that once you have or write about something and use your imagination, it actually reverberates into your life because it creates a form of healing. Indeed, indeed. So thank you once again for your wonderful book, which is um, The Kabbalah of Writing. And I will be putting a link to this in the description box. And if people wanted to find you and get in touch with you, how do they do that? Well, on Facebook, Sherry Mandel, S-H-E-R-R-I-M-A-N-D-E-L-L, -L, or they can email me at sherrymandel at gmail.com. And I'm on Instagram at sherrymandel10. So, oh, and we have... We have a foundation called the Kobe Mandel Foundation. So I have a page on that also. It's uh, Kobe Mandel, K-O-B-Y-M-A-N-D-E-L-L, -L, org. And I have, there's a page that features me. So you can also um, sign up for my mailing list or be in contact with me through that page. Wonderful. I'll be putting a link to that in the description box as well. Thank, Thank you, you for your time today, Sherry. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Uh, next time, we're going to be looking at spiritual intelligence. Until then, or before then, do remember to look at my own website to find out what I'm doing. Until next time, goodbye.